Good morning, everybody, and, and good afternoon for all the guys on the East Coast, uh, a little bit like in New York. Um, so I'm really happy to, to contact the panel. Today's title is the Venture Capital 2023. Um, I'm personally uh, running a Silicon Hill Ventures and been here in Valley for like 35 years. And uh, but I, I think that it's not about me, about what, what it is that I do is more about the great panels that we have today. I just wanted to say that, you know, uh, last year we, we had the same panel. We had a little bit different situation. This, you know, the 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 uh, venture capital uh, in general was, you know, the outlook is very rosy. Today we have a <clears throat> $74 billion in total funding and in, in Q3 which is about 34 decline percent decline over the quarter. Then we have a uh, 71% uh, drop in the birth of the unicorns. So that's kind of a sad. So, so the, the, the good news is that the panel is today, we have uh, expertise and, and, and kind of spotting out uh, um, as something that, that could be made out of the, the, the current situation. So without the further ado, I, I would like to start with, <clears throat> with uh, let, let's go in a different order because David has already had spoken. So let me have uh, uh, Eric to start introducing himself and his company, and then we'll, we'll move on. Can you guys hear me? Hey guys, I'm Eric Cooper. I'm the CIO of uh, Foundtech Ventures. We are an early stage venture investor. Um, I'm in Dallas. We have a, a partner, silent partner in Austin. We also, we're truly global. Um, we One of my partners is in London, one is in Cyprus. So we are a deep tech uh, venture capital company. We have, we've been operating as sort of like a merchant bank slash independent sponsor for the last two years before COVID. Um, invested a lot of our capital into several deep tech deals across the globe. Um, so, and we're about to, uh, launch a fund. So it's, it's, a it's a scary and daunting task right now, given the market conditions, but, um, but you know, it's a, it's a, it's a new world. So we're excited. Um, my a little bit about me, I'm a crazy longhorn grad. I have a 10 year old and a seven year old. My older son is named Colt. He wants to be a vet. So he's probably going to go to A&M. So I don't really know how I feel about that. Um, been married for almost 20 years. Um, got my uh, my master's in global finance at the University of Denver. I've been in and out of uh, corporate and investment banking most of my career, and I've been an entrepreneur too. Um, let's see, I think that's about it for me. I, I also did a, a short consulting stint, but Wall Street doesn't do really well with consulting. Oh, can we move over? I'll move closer to Ricky. I think he might like that. Is that good? Go for it. All right, Ricky. All right. Hello, everyone. Is Mike working well? Real good. Right. So, thank you, Arthur. Uh, my name's uh, Ricky Tejapaibal. I'm managing partner of Tech Wall Catters. A little intro about Tech Wall Catters. So, our firm was founded back in 2009 as a resource to entrepreneurs as an accelerator program. Back then, there weren't a lot of accelerator programs out there. We were one of the, the first few in the world. And, um, the, the reason we started back then, when an entrepreneur wants to build a, a startup in, in a tech space, then the gravitation is, oh, you got to move to Silicon Valley. And we were founded here, here in Dallas. There's a lot of aspiring entrepreneurs in Dallas and Texas or, or outside of Silicon Valley. So we wanted to make that resource available by bringing in mentors from whether it be from, from corporates, from experienced founders who have built successful companies. Some have exited, some are still growing strong, but they want to give back to the the next generation of uh, entrepreneurs. So as our program grew, we've had uh, eight more uh, smaller funds that we invest in the, uh, the pre-seed level. And those companies have gone on to do really well. We have 13 exits. Some of them have gone to raise the you know, Series A, Series B, Series C. What we realized was that uh, as the companies grow, we have parada rights, follow-on rights, and we know the founders really well. So if we want to invest more, they'll us invest even more. But with with a small fund approach, we weren't able to invest in that. So now we're, we're working on a larger fund that, that we're starting to get the family offices and talking to some institutions to invest in a, a structure that we'll do. We'll still get the deal flow from the accelerator. We may get deal flow from outside the accelerator because we talk to over a thousand startups a year and then invest in that uh, seed up to series A and then have some follow on drive out. And our portfolio is about 80% US, 20% from outside the US. If it's coming from outside the US, 
we want to help them the U.S. market, which uh, oftentimes is a bigger market. And even for U.S. companies, we tell them that to think global from early on, that sometimes a lucrative market may be outside of the U.S., that, that, that there's some demand, but you can't go into some foreign country without knowing the market. So we have to connect them with the right partners, with the, the right investors. So we're headquarters, still headquartered here in Dallas. We have uh, team members out in San Francisco and, and, and New York as well. Uh, just a little bit. So we're, we're targeting about 100 million. Wonderful. David? Um, so by background, I've been part of 18 funds across a 40 year history. I'm currently not uh, pitching a fund or LPs for funds. I've, um, because of COVID, I largely shifted into operational roles in startups. I currently have a portfolio of about 20 that I have some fractional portion of, either a trade for um, operating labor from a pool that I manage or um, as a direct investment from funds that we've had before. Um, but I, what, you know, what I think is an interesting contribution to this specific panel is there, we're a lot of early stage guys here. Um, so the conversation I would love to engage in is um, sort of breaking the myth um, in VC that you really need to wait until the first million dollars of revenue or you need to wait until there's some proof of market traction or you need to wait until the technology has really been developed in a marketplace to know that there's time to invest in, a, you know, in an opportunity. And the thesis that I've worked with the last 20 years has been there is way more return and a way better price in terms of alpha in the investment, the earlier you go. Yes, there is increased risk, but the price improves faster than the risk um, uh, uh, compensates against it. You need to know how to manage those risks either through diversification or through specific knowledge or any, any of a half dozen different strategies, which I think this group can tease out pretty well so that you can get the benefit of the higher return that's there in the earlier stage. And that's the magic, for, for me, that's the magic of VC as an alternative investment as, an, as a um, family office. You know, why, why, do you, why do you bet a portion of your available resources in the VC uh, play? Because it's, um, it's not correlated with the market. It's an opportunity to pick up emerging tech or surprising growth that otherwise wouldn't be there in more mature investments. And um, that, and it's, and it potentially is a lot of bang for the buck. Um, so, you know, that, that's, that's what I'd love to engage in. Um, let's, you know, particularly deep tech is a, is a, is a favorite topic of mine and um, in, in early stage in the conversion of early rights into long-term plays in the second and third investment, I think is also another very powerful strategy because you have asymmetrical information the market doesn't have. Um, that interesting. Wonderful. Very, very good. Uh, <clears throat> so let's start with, with the uh, underlining fact that most of the panel right now is, is kind of uh, revolving around the early stage uh, "Quote unquote alpha funds uh, investment pre-seed and then round a kind of a level, right? And then <clears throat> we know that uh, today's technology in general is, doesn't really uh, attract as much of the attention of the big boys right now until <clears throat> the, the pre-revenue deals are probably gone off the table for a little while. So my first question will be to Eric, to the entire panel is, is okay, so I'm a small startup and and then how do I engage and, and kind of like building up a, a you know big tech? How do I get the barrier of entry such that you know I still develop the my revenues and <clears throat> trackability of, of my business and and then I can potentially go for the bigger rounds either to the family office or to the VCs. So Eric, can you tell me like how, you know, what, what's, what's the clear, you know, what's the definition of the deep tech? Because that's, that's another thing that we should probably explain to the audience. Okay. So can you guys hear me? Cause I think there's a question about that. Um, okay. It's better. Um, so deep tech, um, the term has been around for quite some time. Um, you know, it's not shallow tech. And I, I say that as a joke, it's, you know, we're not going to, 
it's not going to be web stuff or apps or SaaS. You know, we're not SaaS holes at Found Tech Ventures. Um, so I say a lot of jokes that are probably relatively inappropriate. Um, so, you know, <laughs> um, you know, deep tech is, it has been around for a while, um, but, you know, in defining it, it's, it's something that's very signed that, that requires something very scientific or engineering um, fo um, focused. And it's, it has, it's going to have a longer term time horizon versus other types of deals in general. So um, the way we look at it is, you know, they, these are the types of deals that need to be de-risked. So that's why we get in early. Um, so did that answer your question, Arthur? Yeah, pretty, pretty much. But what is it like, what does it mean? Do it mean that the, the company, what gets the patents or gets the, uh, uh, like, uh, special contracts with, with exclusive contracts with some, uh, potential customer, what does it in the reality means? Like if I'm building the app, building up the company, right? What is those deep tech like qualifications? What, what are these things? So, you know, it's not an industry. So, you know, you get on Axial or you get on PitchBook and you try to look up deep tech, you might come up with something. So there's no industry, there's no sector, there's nothing like that. Um, so, you know, what is it? It's, it's going to be ubiquitous to everything. Um, you know, most VC investors like, you know, they kind of bifurcate between hardware or software. With deep tech, there's a convergence between those two. Um, and, you know, it is geographically agnostic and it's going to solve some sort of big problem. Um, and, you know, examples of deep tech, it could be, it's obviously going to be AI. There's going to be a component of AI there. Um, there could be advanced materials. There could be, it's going to be space tech. It's going to be things like um, energy um, and clean tech. It covers everything. So it's all the bigger problems. Okay, great. Anybody wants to throw in their definition to the, uh, so, um, so um, one of my peculiarities is I have 800 inventions in 900 hands. Um, and if you go 40 years ago, deep tech was the invention of statistics and actually doing big data. So I'm one of the authors of SPSS, one of the first statistical software programs, which I would tell you is right now you would call it a, a SaaS uh, software subscription service and not deep tech, but it was 40 years ago. Um, so my definition of deep tech is a fundamental change in the way um, some piece of technology operates or the capacity of a piece of technology that hasn't surfaced in the marketplace yet, hasn't been proven through market traction, but which fundamentally will change the way things which are in the marketplace will operate. So for example, a demonstrable change in the price of a battery, a demonstrable change in the capacity to store data, a demonstrable change in the ability to reconfigure a data center. So switching data centers from packet switch to circuit switched optical networks that don't depend on a particular speed of the backbone of the network. Um, or um, a demonstrable change in the way you connect to the internet, for example, uh, through microsatellites, that's a deep tech play. Or um, so, there's an element in it which is a fundamental change to an infrastructure of technology, some layer in the technology stack. Um, there's also a demonstrable um, headwind in terms of commercializing it. So deep tech comes along with its own risks. Um, how are you going to prove to somebody who's going to give you money that this thing that we're talking about developing is actually going to convert commercially to something important? Um, and the way you do that is by showing the specific markets it impacts when it converts. Why does speed of transmission, volume of transmission, de-risking of transmission, why does the ability to process this kind of information, what does it change? And you have to do that through very thorough understanding of what the impact of the technology is. Back to, I, I loved um, you know, the response. That's why we de-risk it. Um, so of course it's very early and it has a three or five year longer time. So typical VC investment is seven to 10 years before you see your money back, by the way, if we haven't mentioned that. Deep tech is at another five years or potentially shorten it by five years, depending upon how quickly the technology converts. Um, and, and have you do that by bringing in um, expertise that understands the scaling of an emerging piece of technology and the commercialization of an emerging piece of technology. How does it get to market? 
And those are typically not done by the inventors of the technology. They're done by the inventors of the business system that transports it there. Right, right. But how do you do that? I mean, we're, we're talking about the alpha here funding, right? So how, how do you do it with the limited resources, the seed money? I mean, is it even possible to, to build a uh, deep tech, say, with the pre-seed money? Or, or is it it's just going to be a long play from the point of view of, of actually having early seed being, uh, you know, raised by alpha funds or whoever to the certain level of acceptability by the venture capital or, or you know, family or whoever, because none of those plays are going to be like uh, able, you won't be able to develop it for 5 million bucks, right? Okay, so I mean, if you want a, a quick answer, um, deep tech is usually a hybrid strategy across a whole bunch of different spectrums. So you'll find deep tech in different pockets. You'll find some pieces in academia that will be around a piece of technology. You'll find some pieces in use cases because they've just been trying to solve a really hard problem and they've and they've hit upon a technology that solved that problem in one location, but they didn't realize the, the other commercial opportunities. Or where you've done it from repeat founders who after 25 or 30 years of doing this other thing they were successful at actually pursued the thing they want and they and they had enough to get the first 10 or 15 million up themselves. Um, and you know you can give lots of examples. It's usually a hybrid example. But you're right, deep tech actually costs more money to get started. It's not a million dollar SaaS app. Um, it's a five or 10, or again, we can ask Eric the, you know, the question, what do your deep tech projects cost? Give it, give us, can you give us an example of some of them in this scale? Um, well, it's, it, it will be quite a bit, but you know, one of the things, you know, to your, to your question, Arthur, about, um, about how you get these companies up up, up the J curve more quickly, you know, one of the things that we're doing is we're creating our own sandbox, our own ecosystem. So, you know, and we want people in those sandboxes who play well together and that sandbox who play well together. So what does that mean? It's the, the attorneys, the tax company, the tax and audit companies that can help um, the, the entrepreneurs get up over that hump and focus on the technology and not necessarily the business. And as, as a investment group, you know, we're also going to assist them with the commercialization of that. Got it. Oh, I got it. Then Rick, Ricky. Yeah. Yeah. So my take on this is uh, we look at it in milestones and, and even our accelerator, we have the, the milestone method that helps investors de-risk. And if it's deep tech, then the milestones may not be in terms of customer adoption or commercialization, but what key parts of technology that has been proven successful in that stage of research, because then it de-risks part of it. And the objective of an early stage investor is also to hand it off to bring in a later stage investor in. So what would an age, later stage investor in deep tech be looking for in terms of how far the technology has been moving along? And of course, the, the founders, the, the team, do the founders have the right skill sets to get that to that point and, and prove it with whatever capital that, that we have, whether it be a few hundred thousand dollars, a few million dollars, to, to that prove that that this is a company at the trajectory in line with the companies that can go a lot further. And, and another point on deep tech is with what we're building is one thing, but a lot of times it meets technology from other aspects that's going to enable it. So there are some companies that may be visionary, but they're ahead of their time. So mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. This is not a deep tech company, but uh, say YouTube. Before YouTube, there were other companies that wanted to do video streaming, but because internet bandwidth just wasn't there. So YouTube just came at the right time. So if, if you're trying to build deep tech, you're relying on other technology to feed it. And if you're at the right time that you can feed it, that not just technology is out there, but it's also at a price that you can feasibly source it in and, and build up along, and, as well as other supply chain other issues that, that if you get that to work, then it's something, because you get asked a lot, that why has it, it that hasn't been done before? Is anybody else doing it? And why that you're the right team, the, the right time to do it? Yeah. Actually, <clears throat> that sounds really, uh, you know, for all, you know, in terms of what we can cover about the deep tech, I, I'm, I'm more, more, more curious because we have a really interesting situation here with David being, you know, like 30 year veteran of, of investing in the startups in, 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 in Texas. And now he's being in Ultrecht in, uh, in the Philips land, right? 
um, and uh, <clears throat> I just wanted to to get out of you like how you know the Europe usually has a really rich programs for getting the seed money like you can get 250,000 euros very quickly uh, it comes with a lot of paperwork but uh, you know at least it's non non uh, you know non equitable amount of monies that you can no, get really. Yeah, yeah no, you know, equity, sorry, uh, amount of monies that you can take out of the governments. And how's that compare? Like, how, what's the situation looking like? You know, how, how would you compare the your current experience right now in in Holland versus the one of, of doing the investments and, and you know, uh, getting getting the company companies up here uh, in, let's say, whatever the United States, but specifically Texas? So I, I would say that that characterization in general is true. Um, the European investment environment and, and the Netherlands has always been very entrepreneurial. It, it has um, probably the best priced R&D centers you can find um, in Europe for whatever it is you're deciding to do R&D around as a corporate. Um, and that, that turns into a, a, um, a quite substantial pool of well-educated engineers who've had their degrees paid for largely by governments and support. You can get a PhD in the Netherlands paid by the government while you get a stipend earning it, as opposed to in the United States, you go into substantial debt. So there are very well-educated engineers, there are very well-educated scientists here that are available to participate in startups and they're rewarded for doing that. There are government programs that will fund them to support startups. And there are incubators and programs for the first three levels of a startup through about an A-plus round that will fund the startups on the, at a commercial basis at scale. So we're not, they're not competing with um, a thousand VC funds or 2000 incubators to get on a program. There's government programs that'll do it and their tax structures that'll support it. So that early stage entrepreneurial gap that we have in the US is not as dominant here. You can get that first quarter million or half million and, and you can get um, your patents paid for by, largely paid for by the government instead of you having to fund them. So in terms of an environment that would support deep tech, I would tell you Europe is better at it. Um, the follow on rounds, uh, once you hit a $5 million investment or a $50 million investment, you're much better off going back to the coast of the United States and pursuing people that have the experience doing that scaling again and have the market the larger marketplace at least you know i'm i'm not an expert i haven't been here 30 years um but the you know in, incubate in europe uh follow on in the united states would be my summary um, and and i can give you you know examples of the tech that's here and supported um i've seen um very sophisticated uh merge reality i've seen very sophisticated um, early, uh, you know, early onset Alzheimer's detection. Uh, so biomedical, I've seen um, very sophisticated um, um, basic chemistry and battery and semiconductor technology. That's um, in the U.S. I would have thought it was a laboratory at MIT. Here is actually an incubator with uh, people properly, you know, doing real leading edge science but funded as a startup owned by a private entity that's trying to commercialize it, not owned by a university. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's just very interesting. So, so if, if you get the patent, uh, the patent is owned by who, by the entrepreneur, or is it, is it all by? I, um, so, um, well, well, the taxes are high in the Netherlands taxes are, and there's actually support for small businesses. There's, there's no capital gains tax here. You want, you want a shocker, uh, um, how's that going to support uh, the startup environment directly supports it um, put your put your money in something that gains um, um, did that right. yeah. yeah pretty much so I mean I just wanted to see like a, you know you, you're kind of like fresh on the new boat right going yeah. to the old land and uh, and and essentially you know what we're your compar comparable notes between the you know doing the business in Texas versus in in Europe, and I agree. Like early stage, it's really easy, uh, but then you choke, and then uh, and if you select the wrong VCs in Europe, uh, 
you wind up having to give up so much of the company that the company literally is not fundable on a global basis. Meaning that uh, all of a sudden the entrepreneur that had started finds finds himself having such a residual value of his own business that none of the Wilson Sansinis or anybody out there will be able to straighten out the cap table to be able to go for yeah. the big rounds to have the company becoming a global company. And, yeah, and staying... so they're back to the theme that, uh, you know, the thing, uh, th th there's a common thing, I think all of us would agree around deep tech, which is if you want to risk it, make sure you have really strong advisory. Um, so either that's provided by investors who come in early or that's sought out by the company so that you have a diverse view and you understand different options for the growth path. And, and, and exactly back to what you're saying, Arthur, if you're launched in Europe, make sure that you have a window and a foothold and investors that have, that have that bridge back to Silicon Valley and, and uh, Silicon Valley, and Silicon Valley is a little bit south, farther south, uh, farther north, I'm sorry. Um, 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 and that bridge back to you know New York and the Massachusetts and other places that are experienced in that critical growth cycle between A and C. Um, because if you're if you have a little more pampering in the early stage, you may not be as commercial or as um, um, you know market development focused as you need to be in order to get through the next couple of rounds when your product takes off and you have post -market product market fit. Um, so that's that's very well found and very well understood in the United States. That scaling is what I would say. You know, take to heart that the United States does well, especially converting them into mega deals at the top end. Those don't happen in Europe. You just look at the mix of investment. Um, yeah, following on what David said has said, um, it's all 100% true. Um, one of the things that Europe also has, they have different kind of there's some different regulations. So if you look at um, the Netherlands, um, ING, Rabobank, the banks will direct invest directly into some of the startups. So there's there's that. And then, you know, they have a wonderful basket of, you know, software engineers who have focused on AI and they're, they're, they're just incredible. I think they're probably a little bit, a little bit ahead of us um, because they're not the, the, they don't have the constraints that we have here. Um, so they're open to things. And then, you know, we have four of our investments are in Europe and, uh, you know, one of them uh, to, to David's point um, has gotten a ton of match funding from Enterprise, Enterprise Ireland, if I could talk. So, you know, there, there are sources of capital over there to help um, buttress and develop the startups in a more organic way where there's more alignment with the capital and the entrepreneur, so. I agree, agree with what, what uh, Dave and Eric said. And uh, that part of Europe, Western Europe, Northern Europe, we like in the sense that uh, very highly educated population, not a lot of the population want to do entrepreneurship, but the ones that do, then, then they have the, the skills, the, the, the tools, but uh, they also need support in a lot of on the, the business side, on the fundraising side. And uh, we see that the valuations outside the U.S. sometimes may not be as high in the U.S. So there's an opportunity for a U.S. based fund. A, if we can go find those companies and help them bring them to the U.S., that then as they start to build their, their customer base, build business in the U.S., then the next funding round will be at a more valuation. So we like that with with uh, with Europe. We like that with uh, say parts of Asia, Southeast Asia as well. Culturally, there's a lot more adaptation that's that's needed for an entrepreneur from Asia to come to the U.S. And that's why it has to be investor that understands this uh, culture and cross border aspect. And it's not for everybody. Some some VCs just stay away from international companies altogether. But, but I think the ones that that do and have the the right uh, tools, the right uh, expertise, then th there'll be some outsized returns that can be made. Got it. Yeah, so well, your, your, point, your point, Ricky, was there can be better prices in other markets, is what you're saying. I think that's right, you know, as an investor. The San Francisco got expensive, uh, is another way to say it. It, it is and it isn't, right? Yeah. Because when you think about the expense, I mean, it has to be all weighed out because if, if you see the successes of the incubation of, let's say, the Y Combinator, which during the COVID time uh, allow for the interviews with pretty much global companies, right? So, so you no longer have to endure 
uh, living expenses of, of San Francisco. So it's up and opened it up itself o- over to uh, to the entire world. And then you will see the number of companies right now that are being funded by YC. It's just, uh, you know, very like the local companies are, are getting less and less space. And then it, it, it's it's kind of wildly accepted that those are the uh, new rules. However, um, all of the local ones that that are you know that are paying the bills, the high bills of of living in Manhattan, but but you know dealing with the daily life of San Francisco, um, it uh, you know they they definitely have a mentoring and and uh, and then also the checkbook support that nobody else has in the world. And and that that has not changed, and I don't think that it will ever change. To be honest with you guys, I mean, for as long as you know, we're we're kind of like a cent, you know, like a tech technology centric uh, region of, of the country, and and uh, you know, there is migration to Austin here, there, wherever. Um, but in in the terms of of creating a new entities, uh, I I think that you know the Silicon Valley still still kind of leads. This international crowd of validation and 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 then having a credible, uh, really smart people helping out the the, the company to grow. But but in any event, I I, I want to. So, so there's a very interesting topic buried in there, which is what is Texas good at? Because we have a Texas flavor here, um, um, and I would actually say the very earliest stage, back to the very early incubation within the American ecosystem, Austin and Dallas. Um, and there's pieces in San Antonio and in Houston are really outstanding at the very beginning of the tech development. The getting to B round, C round, I know um, San Francisco is king, uh, or, uh, um, but uh, very early stage, uh, at least um, after the breakup of Austin Ventures, um, is that's that's a concentration you see in Texas going very well. If if you're again willing to go early, there's really good tech here, um, mm-hmm. because there's very again a very strong tech base of operate a substantial operating companies that brought tech. Exactly, out. that's what that's what and Dell and you know I, and Compact and I, I'll give you a lot of tech companies that. You know, yeah, I, I, I Dell, Compact, and then you know Tesla has moved in the. Uh, the headquarters right now from Fremont to Austin, you know, it's all good. But you guys, like, uh, you know, like you, you're you building now European companies. So I'll let the uh, Eric and Ricky tell tell us, you know, what do they do in Texas to to make those changes, right? And and then go beyond the seed round or, you know, build, build those unicorns here. So Ricky, tell us about your unicorns for 2023. Where, where are we going to see from your stable? Yes, so, so Texas entrepreneurs, I feel, are very resilient. So they're able to do a lot with little capital because it, it doesn't cost as much to start at the earlier stages. And I think that the, once you can get to that A and beyond, then it, it's equal footing. Then you go raise money from, from Silicon Valley. You, you, you're on, on the pathway. But I think early on is something that there's... A, potential there. And to get to the unicorn level, then it has to be, the, the problem has to be big enough, the market has to be big enough. And uh, right now with, uh, if we had this conversation a year ago, we would look at the, the market, the world very differently. And now pretty much we are all in agreement that, that the, the world, the economy is going for a downtrend. It may be one or two years until recovery. So then if you look at back from the previous financial crisis, like what, what happens, which industry that, that retracts this discretionary spending will go down, or even corporates that, that they're going to cut down on a lot of these capital expenditure stuff, which for early stage tech, it's good because tech innovation by in general is already to replace existing incoming technologies by doing something more efficient faster at a much better cost, but you just have to look at which one that that's high, high priority, quick impact industry. So I think uh, B2B, SaaS, that that's targeting, that segment is still going to be good. E-commerce efficiency, bringing the cost down in say FinTech transaction costs will go down. I think there's that, the sustainability aspect, that, that's another bucket that, that we like. Climate tech is always going to be there, and uh, food security. Now we see that the, the what's going on geopolitically that some of the world supply chain is getting disrupted. So, mm-hmm. food, 
natural resources, th those things are going to be be important. And also lifestyle as well, that, that uh, whether it be sports, mental health, I think th those are the things that, that as the world goes through a lot of these uh, tough times. And, and we, we've seen it, the, the, the story already during the, the pandemic, that by changing people's behaviors, a lot of these support system is needed. And then now with, with, with the way that, that coming out of inexpensive capital back to a more capital conscious way, that then the prioritization into these things, I think is, is going to accelerate. Well, and also if you look at the state, you know, there's, um, there's a lot of resilience here. If you look at his, historically through the SNL crisis and, and the financial crisis and everything like that, the, this state in general is, is very diverse among the different industries and sectors that it's in. Um, you know, um, Dallas, Houston, Austin, they all do different things. They have different, they have uh, different competitive advantages, but you know, the, we're what, the ninth largest economy in the world. Um, California might have overtaken Germany, I think this week is number four. Fifth, fifth. yeah, fifth. fifth, to, fifth? Yeah, okay. Fifth. So, I mean, we're, we're, I guess we're not as great as California from that perspective, but, but we're getting there. And I, I think there's been a lot of money made across a bunch of different industries and, you know, there's going to investors need diversification. And so, um, you know, there's there's also uh, in Dallas, we have more uh, Fortune 500 headquarters than any other place. We have lots and, and lots of large technology companies, telecom companies. And, you know, there they're dreamers who are software engineers and and scientists at those companies that um, that are going to want to leave because working at large companies kind of sucks. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I I just came back from the uh, tech crunch uh, the, this week, yeah, yeah, last week, and uh, and I noticed that uh, generative uh, AI is the label that that get the company funding. I mean that word was repeated about hundred times per presentation, uh, whatever it means, right? But uh, let me ask you. Uh, David, is what what is the future of 2023? Where, what's, what segments you will be most comfortable investing in uh, outside of generative AI? Well, and in fact, about half of what I'm doing connect, is connected to AI because the increase in computing performance and what you can do with it in terms of getting closer to what human beings used to do or exceeding them in certain domains is more and more feasible. So AI is an element of a lot. Um, there are fundamental changes still happening in materials because of our ability to really understand at smaller and smaller scales how to make materials in a way that is commercially viable. So we're seeing coatings and magnets and electricity and um, insulators and, and get cheaper and better. Um, so again, there, there, there's fundamental structures there. So, and then... Um, um, in within the world of medicine, because healthcare has been so well funded the last two years, um, there's transformative things happening around um, auto medicine. So, creating a solution to your health problem through your body through transformative means there is for me very interesting. Uh, so, knowing how to boost somebody's own immune system and examples of that, we're making precursors to medicines. That are that do not have to travel through regulatory traditional regulatory methods. Um, you know, if I had to pick three areas that will continue to grow, be absolutely resistant to any downturn in the economy, are fundamental. Um, you know, in 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 order to pick a, a team that can deliver that, you have to look at the breadth of the team and the route to commercialization and scale, and and who's on board. And it's not just the management team of the company, but it's the extended team of the advisory and the investors and the, and the commercialization partners. You, you can't bring a piece of tech to market by yourself. You always have to do it in an environment of partners and market partners and access to the market. So it's usually more than just who you are as a company. It's how you play with other companies and what that, what that role is. Great. And you guys, what, what do you, what do you, what's your Ricky? Uh, which segments are, are on your radar right now for the 2023? Yeah, yes, like, like I mentioned, that the, so, so we have themes that we're bullish for 2023, and actually not just for 2023, but for the next uh, three to five years, because when, when we get in at, at this uh, early stage, then that's when we start to see an inflection point in about two to three years. So there's the e-commerce bucket, there's the sustainability bucket, and then there's the, the lifestyle bucket. 
and, and we, we try to see what funding dollars that's going to be available coming in from the different, whether it be from the, the, the corporate sectors or even from say government stimulus that that's going to accelerate on say climate tech or, or, or certain areas that, that uh, are underfunded in, in the past. And, and with some of these opportunities, we, we're trying to see which areas that that's uh, going to accelerate. Um, how about you? Uh, Eric, what are you, what's your top three, let's say? Um, if I'm looking at my crystal ball for 2023, a couple things that we're really can, we're focused on a little bit, or, you know, we're focused on a lot of different things, but uh, dual use um, military tech, that's very interesting to us. And then also materials, advanced materials, there hasn't, in our minds, there hasn't been enough focus on that. Um, you know, we have, we have a interesting company that we're doing due diligence on. I can talk about that later, but um, those are, that's kind of what we see going into this, this next year. Of course, there's, you know, an AI component of most of all that stuff, but, yep. Is your, so, is your materials around the structure or electricity? What's that? What, 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 what kind of material? I'm curious. What? Um, that's a great segue. Uh, actually, it's, um, it is a uh, programmable graphene coding for robotics. So, okay. yeah, so it actually allows the robotic hands, arms, whatever, to have tactile touch like a human. Yeah, cool, yeah. I, I, I suppose that the, there's a lot of interest also in the $100 billion fund uh, to convert the uh, semiconductor business. And is the Texas actually doing anything and in, in attracting some of that money? Uh, do you know? Um, we've had we've had a very strong presence in semiconductor, you know, just in Austin to pick um, from AMD and uh, Motorola and the you know the follow-on to Motorola and pieces of Dell that people don't talk about. Um, and there's there still is there's spin-offs that come as a result of that. All of those tech players. Uh, if if you had to pick my favorite place to find a startup that would really do well converting technology into something long run, there was probably an old Motorola CFO or a business manager or a treasurer left in there from the 300 or 400 of them that Motorola spun out of their system. Um, uh, you know, so you want a marker of an Austin or a Dallas um, that's going to do a well, look for, you know, look for an old Motorola player in it. Um, Where's it going in the future? I don't, I'm not, I'm not tracking it. I don't have a piece of that. Um, you guys? So I actually worked at Motorola from 20, okay, there 20 you go. 15, around yeah. that time frame, but I was in uh, Schaumburg, Illinois. Yeah. So it was a, a different uh, market, but uh, yes, I think that from, what are we from the funding dollars, but also from the business friendly aspect that you see a lot of corporate relocations coming into Texas and most notably the tech space, Tesla, that that is because during, during the pandemic that Elon, it just, uh, they couldn't resume production. It's just a lot of these uh, mundane policies or, or, or rules that, that drive these uh, tech companies crazy. So I think with that, that the Texas is open for business, a lot of attracting whatever companies from the outside, talent from the outside. It's, it's a melting pot that people who sometimes the stereotype of Texas always at the, the Wild West is a certain demographics, but it's actually a melting pot. You get people from all over the U.S., a lot of people internationally coming in. I think they say Houston's the most diverse city in, in the U.S., Dallas, Austin, San Antonio, all, all these, these cities that, that, that it's a very livable, welcome environment that, that uh, attracts people. And also the risk from leaving a six-figure salary job to get into starting your own startup or take a, a pay cut to join a startup as an early employee, the risk is not as much as when you're in a very high cost of living environment that, that you're, mm -hmm. say, my mortgage bill here is a lot less than yeah, you runway, rent, pay rent, basically, runway. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, runway and, and, and just, uh, yeah. you don't have to deal with that, that, those kind of stress, that it's stressful enough to be a founder or start a business. You don't have to deal with all these uh, regulatory or the, the minimum cost of living stress. Yeah, I agree with you, uh, Ricky. Yeah, it, it's pretty stressful to live in the Bay Area, although, you know, the cost uh, of living is coming down because a lot of birds kind of flew to uh, to Austin and, and uh, you know, other places, to Atlanta. So uh, we, we're looking at real estate-wise on a little bit of a decline 
towards like it inching down about 10 percent down but but still it's 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 a significant amount of money comparably to you know if you compare it to any other places like uh I don't know what the what the old track uh, you know real estate is. It's probably also pretty pricey, but uh, uh, but yeah, that's that's one of the costs that that one you know when when you build the team, it's it's just a significant. But 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 talking about the regulations, say that if you if you were to build the fintech company, you know there's so many regulations and layers that you you know if if you started in San Francisco. You, you, in order to properly comply, most of your employees that have to do with the with the car business, they they actually have to be physically in 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 the city. So, so that that creates the, this disadvantage. But of course, you know the payback is huge, right? If you, if you're successful, if you build a stripe, then you know then then that 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 is all okay because then everyone can afford to sustain the the cost of living and then has some little bit of money left to go to you know to Sierras or wherever. But going back to our topics of the technology, I think that we have about like ten more minutes to kind of wrap up the panel, right, Marty? So, I just wanted to to kind of ask each individual uh, panelist to, to kind of get a two, three minute roundup of where, you know, where, where you, we will talk about the best things where, where to invest in, but I would say like, what, what are your thinking uh, about like, what the next year or two are going to be and then how are you adjusting yourself to meet those, you know, the the the, the scheme that you're 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 working on with with your respectful uh, companies? So let me let me start. Uh, <clears throat> let me start with Eric, and then we'll go to uh, to Ricky, and then to to David. So yeah, if you look from you look at deep tech, you look at all the different. Um, different asset classes out there, right? Um, I don't know about you guys, but from I haven't had any, I've only had paper losses, but they're pretty substantial. I don't really like them too much. My wife's not really happy right now. I have been trading the VIX quite a bit. So um, there's, I've been making money there, but you know, you look at real estate, cap rates are crazy low. It makes me scared. If you look at PE, debt's getting really, really expensive. You know, um, public markets, equities, debt, they're now positively correlated, which why would you do that? And there, there's, and the volatility scares me. So, you know, um, we're a people business, right? So if you, you invest in, in venture, you invest in people, you're investing in technology too. So um, it's a long-term play, it's, it's capital appreciation, and that's what we're going for. So, you know, what, what we're looking at over the next couple of years is that. So what will provide capital appreciation? appreciation for our investors and then you know what's what's the best route and it's none of the other asset classes that i just mentioned so you know even oil and gas which is is historically volatile of course we have a um we have a world economy that's kind of against it and we still need it so yeah invest in deep tech good summary for that eric so i i agree with a lot of these points and i'd like to reiterate even more is you look at all these uh, cycles when there's a downturn the market, the VC funds that the vintage year that started in, in those years all generated historical high returns. And that, that sends a story to that now, it, it, especially if it bottoms out, I don't know, this year, next year, but it, it'll be a really good time to invest in venture capital because you have this uh, holding period that we're in a long-term play. We're not looking at the, just for a quick flip one or two years. We're, we're, we're looking for something that's going to have impact three to five years, five to 10 years, uh, three to five years seating in, inflection point, and then five to 10 years will be that this uh, really high hockey stick growth. So we're looking at companies that, that have those uh, unicorn potential, but we're also getting at the ground level. So we're not paying a premium. And, and if you look at from last year, the, if you're getting it at later stage or, or companies that are really pre-IPO and IPOs didn't happen, they lost sometimes 50, 60% of their value just because they're subject to our market volatility, but when we get into early stage, we really look at the fundamentals, the founders, the business model, the technology. So we're less prone to those external factors and most of funding is gonna be done by 
equity funding or it could be convertible debt with which the intention is to convert to equity. So we're not really subject to oh, what the interest rates are going to be that, that they're, can they service their debt because that, that's not the capital structure model. So we, we're insulated from, from that sense, but uh, the business risk is high. It, so you're, we're looking at some visionary founders building some products that uh, hasn't been done or disrupt the industry. And we, I call the founders, they're the experts in their industry. They're the best in the world what they do, but none of us are experts in everything. So how do we provide them the, the right support system, the right mentors, the right partners to help de-risk things that, that they don't have to experience firsthand and give them the, the best chance, best probability of success possible. So it's, a, it's an actively managing portfolio for a very early stage, but, but you look at the returns that you're gonna get the, the, from a risk reward standpoint, the alpha is much higher than if you get into to a later stage, which, which then, then you're subject to more market risk and, and less of this uh, value that you're actually organically creating by growing these companies. Yeah. Um, so my, my answer about you know, what's the next year or two look like is in contrast to where VC has been, is in general, there's less cash available. So we're asking founders and startups to be more cash conservative in some ways. Um, typically it'll mean having them develop their own cash flow sooner, faster if they can. So enterprises that are able to do that are more likely to survive a downturn of less follow on capital or capital which from the founder's point of view becomes more expensive to them. Um, is that a long-term benefit? I would say there's a bit of a constriction. So you'll see um, less startups succeeding, but the ones that do succeed are going to be quite robust, robust in self-funding. Um, so there's faster return to the investors, what I would say, with a higher death rate among the uh, investments. Um, and uh, does that create funding gaps for opportunities that really should have been funded? Yes, I think we'll see less emerging opportunities than we might have in the previous periods because cash is tighter. Um, and we'll perhaps see um, less outliers succeed because outliers tend not to get funded in tighter times. Um, um, and that's just the nature of tighter capital. Um, and you know, and my response to that is um, um, for VC funds or people who, who are LPs and VCs encourage reinvestment and redeployment of capital that's already been this risk because we know the investor and, the, and we know the investment and we know the stages. So what Ricky is raising, which is really follow on to what he already knows from early stage, that's a good play, that's de risk or, um, tech that it was already, you know, that, that kind of follow on capital, which already takes some of the early stage out. That's where you, would, that's where I would be. That's where I would put the more conservative cash short term within this model of VC trying to exploit, um, you know, um, th this kind of um, uh, emerging technology. So, sounds good. Um, I, I think that we have a little bit of more time left. Um, and and actually the, the other thing that it's uh, that it's kind of interesting in the, in the today's global situation is that that we have uh, the globalization in general, right? It, it used to be that nobody really cared where all the pieces came from, like uh, for especially for hardware pieces, sometimes software, right? Uh, there was a lot of, a lot of outsourcing uh from eastern europe including ukraine um where where you would have really quality engineers now they're sort of cut off because of the current political situation plus the lack of uh, you know <laughs> getting supply of, of 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 energy and such so um so how do you guys see that in, in, impacting in, in general uh the the, the the current situation of the venture capital versus uh, ver, 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 versus the, so are are we looking more inward right now to resolve all the problems on 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 our local territories and or what what do you think what are the what are going to be the longer terms? Um, I I have a really quick answer to that, which is there's a bias towards software because it, it transports across borders faster, so it actually put a bit of a headwind into hardware and mechanical things and things that have a sourcing, you know, 
a physical sourcing problem. That, that I've definitely seen increase in the last two years. You can't get certain materials and they're hard, you know, it's hard to do it. But the, the software and the engineering content that travels across borders is, is just a reconcentration in things which are um, intellectual versus physical. Right. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I think um, it's not necessarily a bad thing that that I, I think. Well, I think Samuel Huntington was probably right that there are going to be different blocks of 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 countries based on culture, um, which isn't a you know, like I said, it's not a bad thing. So, um, I think companies and startup and capitals capital will be focused more on you know comparative advantage going forward. So. You know what? What would survive a downturn, and what uh, economically makes sense? Just that to, to David's point, I think that the de-risking of supply chain it, we see on the hardware side, but even in the the software side, there's the the de-risking of, of where do you store your data. So a lot of companies that if it's the domicile or data has to be sent over to, to countries where there's not really good relationship, or do we really want to? trust another government may have access to some some data. So I think that's going to come into play more of, of how these companies are are segmented in a way that that or even in terms of split ownership or weight that that uh, we don't have sensitive information has to be stored in countries that we may not trust as much. Great. Marty? Are, are we are we still allocated more time or I think we're there. Marty's going to run a tight ship. All righty. No kidding. <laughs> That's great. Um, fantastic. So, He's well, thank you very much to the one. panelists. And then let's, let's grab guys, Marty. Thank you, Marty. Thank you, Arthur. Wait, Ricky. wait, 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 guys. Hold on. Hey, Matt Brown. Hi there. Hey, Marty. I, hold on a second. I'm slowly asking a question, so I'm so, I'm Sorry. I'm a little Sorry. bit sad that Art is um has uh, has ended his uh, panel preliminarily. Anyway, so the question is this: There's a lot of applications in blockchain on, in finance, right? You're going to see like a a huge eruption next year in uh, blockchain applications used in investment banking and banking because whenever the market declines radically and bonuses go down, Wall Street starts jettisoning units that don't make money anymore, right? I think that's accepted practice. So they start white labeling uh, technology that replaces like, like wealth managers and things like that. So then my next question is, do you ever see any, do you, does anybody out there see any application of blockchain in government? Because it seems like there's lots of requests for information from government that seem to get lost all the time. And uh, maybe it'd be help them track stuff better. Do you guys I've see? Seen, I've specifically seen three. In fact, I think I'm going to get roped into the, the Green Wall Project in Africa. It's got 40 countries trying to put $18 billion into stopping the southern migration of the, you know, the arid the arid band that's heading into the into the African continent. Um, their problem is a governance problem. They don't know how to deploy all that capital and solve the local social problem of where that capital goes. Um, you know, the same thing as state versus federal government of the United States. They're actually deploying a, a, a DAO uh, to solve that as a governance answer, which is for me miraculous, but actually quite appropriate if you know the blockchain technology. Like, That'll, that'll spin your head. Um, Africa, Africa using blockchain to solve a governance problem. Um, a, a, you know, it's like, wow. Uh, but it's got real money behind it. Um, and it actually makes sense. It's the, it's the many to many voting allocation of resources, um, which is a classic right. thing. That the, the original does. comment was kind of tongue in cheek, but of course, you know, people who want to create society and have governance need blockchain. Or something like that, so that well, it, it's transparent, it's non-corruptive. You know, there's so there there are elements of blockchain if applied correctly could actually support that um, tragedy of the commons problem if it, if if there's a government lockup. Right, and if you look at like what Clint Hacker was talking about earlier, and how there's this robo technology that allows you to 
robotically create process and have it done over and over again, you know, that ha really hasn't approached governance yet. I mean, I don't know Texas, but I've been to the DMV in Florida and it's like terrorism, right? So, all right, I mean, just walking into government office to, to do voter registration or things like that, it's it's never fun, right? So you what say, why hasn't all this stuff been automated? Why is this, you know, woman sitting behind the counter that in the same desk she had in 1930s, you know, give, giving me <laughs> my driver's license, right? Or, or whatever, you know, getting my passport. So, you know, it seems like there should be some kind of progressive ability in that, but maybe, I think another VC, and maybe it was Andreas and said, the one thing we try to avoid is anything the government's involved in, like education or stuff like that, administration. So any thoughts? I think that their loss is our gain, but it, it, if they don't look at it and if we have the right expertise, the right contacts that, that we can help companies that, that's related to B2B or B2B to G or B2G, then hey, we're, we're open. I think for back to on, on blockchain, it's about doing it for the right reason. So efficiency, transparency for data that should be transparent. I think I, I agree. I think there's a, the government's open to, to adopting th those kind of things. But data that should still be kept for privacy, then there still has to be a security mechanism to, to do that. But the part that I feel is going to be an uphill battle and we may not want to get involved in is, is using blockchain to circumvent government control. That if the law, the government has authority to, to control certain points of the, of the process and you're trying to use blockchain to go around it, I think that, that, that is, is a battle that uh, may not be won easily. Okay. Well, great job, guys. Thanks so much. And uh, let's all give a hand for a great panel.